George is going to be really rapid, you know, going to flow through it very quickly, so we're going to make up a bit of time. And I'm, I'm going to give him a little note, so give a little note when he sort of gets near the end, so... Um, you, you might notice people who know me chuckle over that statement, but I will try and just um, keep it busy short, but I would be warned for no reason. Should have a few things to make. Um, so the first thing to say about the shift campaign is that it's not, it's not fixed. I think one of the implications of all the things that Charles was saying is that the challenges we face are utterly systematic, as many of the, the questions pointed out. They're clearly not national either. Um, this is about challenging some very, very fundamental currents in our economic and political system. And, and perhaps most importantly, challenging very powerful vested interests. Um, one of the things that I've been most increasingly aware of over the last decade is how my supposedly sort of um, brilliant education had absolutely nothing in it about power. Literally, power was completely left out. And even some texts that I read at, at school that I now understand to be absolutely about power would talk to me without any of that included. And I think this is the this is the factor that we need to sort of keep in view the whole time. As, as Charles has reminded us, and I'm sure most of us were aware of this already, it's not as if we lack the solutions in terms of how we can do things differently. Um, you know, even with a, a global investment climate where fossil fuels are still being subsidised at a rate of five to one over renewables, despite that completely uneven playing, uneven playing field, we've still had vast advances in terms of our capacity to produce the energy we need. Um, without pursuing means that are destroying us. And the irony for you know, anyone who's involved in um, sort of climate denial arguments is that even if it weren't for the climate change, for climate change, the fact that we're killing millions of people through respiratory illness every year because of, of carbon emissions, the fact that we're acidifying the oceans to the point where we're threatening the very basis of marine ecosystems and therefore terrestrial ecosystems as well, all these things are in addition to the fact that we are cooking and destabilising the planet um, to the point where we've had hundreds of percent increase in so-called extreme weather events in the last 50 years. And I say so-called because I'm, I was worried using that phrase that it's a very abstract way of saying droughts, floods, crop destroying rain are some of the most destructive things that can ever happen to people. And as I'm sure most of us are aware, are aware that the consequences of those things are felt especially by um, the most vulnerable across the world, we've done the least to cause the problems we have. So, my, uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes in terms of my path into shift, and um, this is very much in you know, my perspective of the campaign. As I say, many different voices are feeding into it and are, are day by day growing it into what I hope it, it you know, can become. Um, I was, as some of you may know, involved in the Occupy movement quite heavily. Um, my involvement in that was very much a response to 10 years of, of activism of one sort or another, working for various NGOs, going to numerous protests, usually ending up at Parliament on this issue or that issue. And what the Occupy movement seemed to represent was an attempt to engage with the problems we have as systemic, holistic problems, as you know, many, many different symptoms issuing from the same basic disease, which is that the real political decisions that are made and the outcomes they create are vastly divorced from the real interests of the majority of people and are vastly divorced from anything like real democracy. I think it's almost a cliche to the point where we don't even bother saying it that the difference between what politicians say and, and what politicians do is very large. And it's the difference between those two things where, um, that, that brings up the question of power. You know, what is it between what they say and what they do that is making the difference and it's powerful vested interests and unfortunately some of the most powerful vested interests of all time are the current fossil fuel industry and the only more powerful economic interests probably of all time are the banks that fund them. Um, so that is in a sense what we're up against. Lest that sound like an insuperable challenge, I think it's really important to remember that the history of democracy over 200 years, which is after all only a, kind of, a, a dream in progress gradually, that history has been about people getting together in large enough numbers over that 200 year period, roughly, recognising that when they work together with sufficient unity, perseverance and conviction, they can change things. You know, end of slavery, rights of women, decent working conditions, free healthcare, weekends, which we didn't have until 60 years ago, um, you know, and pretty much all the things that, we, that, that our governments sell to the world 
as the benefits of our society it didn't come about through the people at the top deciding to make changes, but the people at the top being pushed into making them. Um, the reason I've been investing so much energy into the shift campaign, and I'm still doing Occupy stuff as well, but the reason I'm investing in this as well is that what Occupy did was bring a huge amount of attention to some very, very critical issues in terms of how power is concentrated in the city of London, how those powerful economic interests are driving outcomes. But what it didn't do was bring together the mainstream. Um, and when we gather from, from polls that 30 40% of people um, were behind what Occupy was doing in principle, um, even though most of them would be told the whole time that we didn't know what, they, what we were saying, most of them did actually know what we were saying and they did agree. But as I say, it didn't bring enough people together in a, in, in a practical manner to have anything like the kind of leverage yet that we need to create. Um, and the shift campaign is about making that happen. And as Charles said, it's about sort of de siloing the, the kind of ngo world, sort of political um, context that we're in. I think what we've lost in the last 40 years um, is programmatic politics. And if you haven't heard the term programmatic, which is just very simple, very simply, a, a political package of measures that addresses. Um, the related problems that we face and the related solutions that we need to create. As long as we're doing this bit for poverty and this bit for, for the environment, this bit for housing, etc., um, we're going to carry on to running around in little groups desperately um, trying to sort of basically, basically doing damage limitation rather than actually getting the mass of people that recognises that all those issues are of a piece. Um, and the Green New Deal, as Charles I think, very it effectively outlined is about housing, it is about culture, it is about equality very much. Um, for anyone who hasn't read the spirit level, that and Treasure Islands are my two sort of Bibles that I try and get as many people to read as possible. Treasure Islands that really dishes the dirt on how the global taxation, the tax haven system, far from being just a problem in the system, is actually the means by which it perpetuates itself. And the spirit level makes very clear that virtually every single major problem in our society, society is very, very tightly related to equality. Um, so the shift is not least about sensible redistribution of resources to where they need it, both in terms of social needs, in terms of investing in um, the renewable energy we need, and it's very key in our, in our demands that you can see on the, the yellow thing on the wall. It's not just massive investment in renewable energy, it's a massive shift to renewable energy. Um, what we have at the moment is certainly an increase in um, investment in renewable energy across the world, but it's alongside massive increases in fossil fuel use and, and investment as well. Um, and as Charles said, also the inertia in our current system is, is enormous politically, um, infrastructurally, etc. So we need to be very realistic that you know the, the time to act was 20 years ago, um, so it's definitely, definitely now. Um, We've got at least another degree of warming in the system already from what we've done, um, from what we've done already, even if we were to stop burning all fossil fuels tomorrow. Um, a more disturbing and I would argue compelling picture is given by a thing called the Apollo Gaia project, which suggests that we've actually got another two and a half degrees to come. So yes, we need to shift to renewable energy, but we also need to invest in resilience, we need to invest in how we're going to deal with this transition. So the basic message is things are going to change very much in the next few decades. The, the challenge is to, to try and make sure that they change in the way that we need them to, rather than um, along the, the disaster capitalist model, which is where we're at the moment, where more and more power is concentrated at the top, and the more problems we have, the more that power seems to concentrate. And it's because we're not tackling things programmatically, to use that word again. Now, there's been one of the most sort of ongoing and fruitful debates within the shift campaign, is the relationship of these two basic digestible demands, which are absolutely the spirit of what we do, and this more systemic narrative that, that you've heard Charles on YouTube that the Green New Deal has been working with. And I think that's one of our big challenges information, is how to communicate to people that this change is actually, on one level, fairly simple. It's about allowing things that we, that we know to work already onto the political playing field instead of the things that we know to be killing us. You know, the phrase I use quite often is, is what we need is a compassionate revolution. And what I mean by that is that we need to get enough people believing that the world outside us should reflect the values that we hold. You know, I've grown up in a world where most of us, including myself, or at least 
of my life have taken for granted that the way the world actually works, or a rail policy, operates on completely different principles from the ones that the 99% claim to believe in. And so this is really just about re-democratising, undoing, undoing consumerism which turns people into individual consumers um, and turning them back into citizens again. Because of course if you see yourself as one individual consumer among 7 billion, then what the hell can you do to change things? You know, what's the point of even thinking about it? When you see yourself as a citizen among millions in this country, among hundreds of millions, billions across the world, that all basically want a decent world for their children, you know, sure that you know we all like nice stuff, but we all equally recognise that what's most important is food, water, shelter, access to medicine, basic level of stability, of you know, relatively equal opportunities for our children and families. You know, this is all fairly simple stuff. Um, have a look at Okay, so I'm going to mention one idea that I've been pushing very strongly in the campaign, and I'm glad to say Charles is, is, a, is a fan of this idea, and I'm, I'm yet to persuade everybody that it's, that it's the way to go. But information politics is one of our biggest problems. We have roughly $2 trillion spent every single year across the world on public relations and advertising. We have an information system that is constantly shaped by the interests of those that pay for it. You know, this is not a conspiracy theory, like pretty much. Any, any business you know, runs on the basis of the interests of the people who pay for it and make hiring and firing decisions and, and the, the media is no different. Um, that system is dedicated roughly to purveying the idea that there is no alternative. This is Thatcher's massive dictum, it's referred to as the Tina Doctrine by some, there is no alternative. And huge changes have been underway in South America in the last 20, 25 years via the World Social Forum movement that has led to the formation of the ALBA countries. And if anyone doesn't know who they are, just ALBA will we'll bring that up um, on, on the internet, that's Bolivia, Ecuador, etc. And they have been motivated by two main motto, two main slogans. One is, another world is possible, and the other is that people united will never be defeated. And I think, again, another world is possible seems like you know, such a cliche as it may not seem worth, worth repeating, but I've long said that my life is about trying to bring truth to cliche, that if we were to remember the truth in the things that we take for granted um, and actually really try and put them into practice we can get to the world we need to um, and this other world that's possible is actually a much nicer one that's the, that's what the, the spirit level makes very clear is that actually it's not about how much stuff there is overall um, our, our collective well-being and there's reams of evidence in that book not from the individual authors but from the OECD the World Health Organization etc etc that shows that if we share what we have, even if we have less, we do much better. And so this campaign actually has an enormously strong base in terms of the scientific evidence, in terms of the evidence available for the huge dysfunction and lack of democracy in the economic system. Um, but what it's about is bringing people together and doing so in a way that tackles that information politics. So it's about making public what I know from, from much of the work I've done in the last 15 years. Um, is already the case in the private sphere. The vast majority of people, when you talk to them about the world, they take for granted that it was, and you and the person you're talking to generally take for granted that it was, if, if it were up to people like you two um, to decide what happens in the world, of course it would be a much better place. But we're told human nature, what, happened, you know, what other people are like, is bad. And what we need to do with this campaign is, is demonstrate publicly that there are um, enough of this to create that critical mass for change to make it happen. And critical masses usually have 3 to 7% of people. It's not about getting 60 people, 60% of all people on the street. It's about getting you know, probably less than 10% of people. Because the vast majority, we look at the polls, they already say they want a more equal world. They want not to destroy the environment. They don't think that you know, the government should be undermined by tax havens, etc. People are sensible en masse. When their prejudice buttons are pushed by the media, they end up making decisions which are actually against their interests. But they already think the right thing. So this idea that I'm going to share with you is the, the idea of pyramid protests, and it's very simply a means to try and get from where we are at the moment, which is lots of little potentially inspiring things happening but not at the scale required, to get to a point where we have something like a sufficient mass of people working together and actually sharing a sharing narrative and publicising that narrative. So the idea is we start at some point, let's say May next year, and this is an idea I'd love feedback on um, today. Um, with 500 people the first month. And the goal of that campaign is to have monthly days of action where you try and double that number every year. 
to use the energy of the people involved, to focus on getting other people that are sympathetic, that do believe in providing a decent world. And just doing the math, using the pyramid model, which has been used so disastrously on our economy and our planet against itself, doing the maths, you go from 5 million to 4 million in a year. And that would be roughly 8% of the UK population, I think, i.e. the upper end of what would be required for critical mass. And I think it's putting the concern that enough of us already have in public to the point where the media and the political system can't avoid it. That's the key step that we need, that we need to take to bring together all this energy that, as Charles said, is already out there in terms of the thousands of NGOs and many different groups working together. So I believe we can bring about this shift but we just need to believe in the possibility of making it happen and inspire each other in a practical way to make it public, to demonstrate, to manifest that change. Thank you very much.